Harriet Tubman, Chapter 5, Flight Every night in the quarter, after the children were asleep, Old Rit and Ben talked about Harriet. Old Rit started the conversation. What's going to happen to Minty, she said. Ben stirred under the ragged quilt and then turned over. You have to trust in the Lord, Rit. He'll take care of her. Rit ignored his reply. Here she is back on the plantation again. She's seven years old and hasn't learned anything special. You know the master isn't going to keep her around here, just kicking up her heels and eating her head off. What'll happen to her? This time Ben did not answer. They both knew things weren't going to well with the master. He needed money. He was hiring out more and more of his slaves. He was selling more and more of them each year. The plantation was beginning to have a ragged, uncared for look. <clears throat> the fences were down. Honeysuckle and bullbriar were slowly taking over the big fields. The outbuildings needed repair. Rit touched Ben on the arm, lightly, to attract his attention. Then she whispered, The trader's back in Cambridge again. He got the big front room at the tavern. Less than two months and he's back again. He didn't used to come so often. She waited for Ben to say something, to reassure her. He knew just as she did that when the trader got ready to leave, some of the master's prime hands were sure to go with him. Well, not exactly with him. They go with the chain gang walking down that long, terrible road that ended in New Orleans or Natchez, chained two by two, and other chained down toward the middle of the group. And each slave chained to that too. She'd heard the white folks call it a coffle or a drove, but told it her, but to her it was always simply the chain gang. Nothing's going to happen to Minty, old Ben said sharply. I'll see that it don't. The sharpness in his voice told her that he was thinking about the chain gang, too, and remembering their two little ones, just about the size of Minty, who had gone away like that. One minute they had been carrying water to the field hands, and the next minute they were in a lot with other slaves that had been sold, sort of thrown in for good measure, and then gone. Gone with the chain gang. But there's nothing Ben can do, she thought. He can try, of course, but the trader had a reputation for driving a hard bargain. And if the master needed the money, and one extra child meant a slightly better price for the lot, why, even Ben wouldn't be able to stop the sale. Rick gave a long sigh. I wish the old days were back again, the days when the master was rich and just raised tobacco, just nothing but tobacco. And everybody worked, even the little slaves helped squash those fat, juicy hornworms that get on the backside of the tobacco leaves. And everybody had plenty to eat, and we all felt safe. In the old days, the master never sold off any of his slaves. Everybody knew that, and Ben agreed with her. Yes, he said slowly. Things was better then. It seems like they seesaw more now. He grows a lot. He grows a little cotton, and he grows a little wheat, and he grows a little corn. Then maybe there's too much rain, or maybe not enough rain, so the crop's no good. Now he's selling the big timber off to the shipbuilders. Pretty soon there won't be any more of them big sands, stands of oak. We keep hacking them down. Day after day, we're hacking them down. What's he going to do when his timber's gone? You know what he's going to do, Rit said impatiently. He's going to keep on raising slaves and selling them off. He gets enough money just from that. He don't have to bother to have his land worked anymore. He just, he's just living off his slaves. Living off his slaves, she thought and little Minty doesn't know how to cook or sew, and the slave trader is in Cambridge, and maybe tomorrow he'll be riding out here. Oh, Ben, she said, what's going to happen to Minty? I guess maybe we just better pray to the good Lord to look out for her, he said. We just better pray. A few days later, Harriet was hired out again as a child's nurse. Rit said, may the Lord be praised. It's an answer to my prayer, to my prayer. May the Lord be praised. Once again, Harriet, the small girl in the tow linen shirt, barefooted, feet not touching the floor of the wagon, sat listening to the clop-clop of the horse's hooves, listening to the creak of a wagon that was carrying her farther and farther away from home. Her forehead was wrinkled by a frown because she kept thinking, Where am I going this time? How long will it take to get there? Why do I have to go anywhere? Suppose she didn't like the people. What could she do about it? She wouldn't know how to get back home. Finally, the wagon stopped in front of a big house. She never did know where it was located, near what town, how far away from the Brodus plantation. But she soon knew what she was supposed to do. She looked after Miss Susan's baby and helped with the housework, too. It wasn't a big family. 
just Miss Susan and her husband and the baby, and Miss Emily, a sister of Miss Susan's, who was visiting. That first morning, Miss Susan told her to go and sweep the parlor and dust it. Harriet was awed by the room. It was a thick carpet on the floor, soft and springy under her feet, like walking on layers of pine needles. And there were so many different kinds of chairs and tables, and the wood around the fireplace was carved into a pattern. She'd never seen anything like it. She swept as hard as she could and then immediately dusted all the dark, shiny wood of the furniture. Miss Susan said, Have you finished? and came in to run her fingers over the shiny surface of the chairs and tables. Her fingers were co coated with dust. Do it again, she snapped. Are you just plain stupid? Why, you haven't dusted in here at all. You do it right, or... Harriet swept again and then dusted, getting more and more frightened. Miss Susan said it wasn't done properly and went and got a whip and kept whipping her and shouting at her and Harriet screamed. Miss Emily had heard the screams. Oh, she heard a voice calling, Susan, Susan, what are you doing? What is the matter? Miss Emily had heard the screams and came down the stairs protesting. Why do you whip the child, Susan, for not doing what she has never been taught to do? Leave her to me a few minutes and you will see that she will soon, soon learn how to sweep and dust a room. Harriet learned how to clean the house. She looked after the baby, too. In later life, she said, I was so little that I had to sit on the floor and have the baby put in my lap. That baby was always in my lap, except when it was asleep or its mother was feeding it. Miss Susan, Susan said that the baby mustn't be allowed to cry. Harriet had to keep rocking it so it wouldn't cry. Every night, the same thing happened. She sat on the floor and rocked the cradle back and forth, back and forth, until the baby went to sleep. Then her head drooped, her eyelids closed, her hands started slipping, slipping, slipping away from the dark, polished wood of the cradle. Finally, she slept on the floor by the cradle. Then the baby would wail. Suddenly, a thin, high, piercing sound. Miss Susan would wake up, furious, and reach for the whip she kept on a little shelf behind her bed. Harriet finally reached a point in exhaustion where she was past needing sleep, where she was, she snatched it in brief moments, head nodding, cl eyes closed, and yet not really sleeping prepared to start rocking the cradle before the baby woke up and cried. Even so, sometimes she went sound asleep to be awakened by the wailing of the baby. She was whipped so often that the back of her neck was covered with scars, crisscrossed with scars, so deep that they would be visible for the rest of her life. Finally, she learned to sleep without really going to sleep, learned to listen while still asleep, head nodding, eyes closed, but all her senses alerted to the slightest movement from the cradle listening, listening, and yet asleep, so that if the baby stirred, she started rocking the cradle. She thought of running away, and didn't. She did not know how to reach the Brodus plantation. She did not know in which direction to walk, assuming that she could have got away from the house. She had no idea how far it was. It had seemed an interminable journey when the overseer brought her to Miss Susan's in a wagon. Sometimes Miss Susan and her husband went out to parties. Then there were plumes on Miss Susan's bonnet, and she wore a silk dress, soft, swishy, and embroidered petticoats underneath, making a rustling sound when she walked. She smelled of orris root, and the master would smile at Susan and toy with his wrist, his wrist chain. On those nights, the baby cried and cried while Harriet slept. Harriet slept, and yet she was listening, sound asleep, but listening, not for the baby, ear straining, even in sleep, for the sound of footsteps on the stairs. Not even footsteps, just the creak of the stairs, and she was awake, because it meant Miss Susan was coming home. Thus she learned to stay alert, even though she was deeply, restfully asleep. During the day, she toyed with the idea of running away. Then she would thrust the thought from her as impossible. Yet she did run away. Years afterward, she described what happened in these words. One morning, after, Miss, after, Susan, after breakfast, Miss Susan had the baby and I stood by the table waiting until I was to take it. Near me was a bowl of lumps of white sugar. My mistress got into a great quarrel with her husband. She had an awful temper and she would scold and storm and call him all kinds of names. Now you know I never had any good, anything good, no sweet, no sugar, and that sugar right by me did look so nice. And my mistress's back was turned to me while she was fighting with her husband. So, I just put my fingers in the sugar bowl to take one lump, and maybe she heard me, for she turned and saw me. The next minute she had the rawhide down, 
I give one jump out of the door and I saw that they came after me, but I just flew and they didn't catch me. I ran and I ran and I passed many a house, but I didn't dare to stop for all the, they all knew my mistress and they would send me back. She ran until she was exhausted. She kept looking over her shoulder. After a while, she didn't see Miss Susan and her husband. She decided that they must have got tired and stopped chasing her. She slowed her pace then at the thought of having to go back to Miss Susan in whatever form of punishment she and her husband would have devised. She started running again. She said by and by when I was almost tuckered out, I came to a great big pig pen. There was an old sow there and perhaps eight or ten little pigs. I was too little to climb into it, but I stumbled over the high part and fell in on the ground, and I was so beaten out that I could not stir. And there I stayed from Friday until the next Tuesday, fighting with those little pigs for potato peelings and other scraps that came down into the trough. The old sow had pushed me away when I tried to get her children's food, and I was awfully afraid of her. By Tuesday I was so starved that I knew I had to go back to my mistress. I didn't have anywhere else to go, even though I knew it. I knew it was coming, so I went back. That same year, 1827, Henry Clay, who was still Secretary of State, appealed the Canadian government again. He asked for some kind of agreement in return in regard to the return of hundreds of fugitive slaves living in Canada. After five months had gone by, the Canadians said, it is utterly impossible to agree to a stipulation for the surrender of fugitive slaves. In the city of New York, two Negroes, John Russworm and the Reverend Mr. Samuel Cornish, began to publish Freedom's Journal, the first Negro newspaper in the United States. And that is the end of chapter 5.